Hello everyone, welcome to Interpret and Tradition. Today I want to pay tribute to the country I love and that is England from an immigrant perspective. Uh, I'm going to tell you a lot of uh, anecdotes perhaps to to sort of explain why I have this special love for this country. This nostalgic um, feeling that I have at the moment for England uh, this uh, was was prompted this morning by a letter I received from the Inland Revenue telling me that I am due a tax refund. <laughs> it's not very much, but it's a nice surprise. My birthday is tomorrow, so um, I thought, what a, what, a, what a great gift. And I started thinking about how many countries do, do they actually, you know, the government itself tells you, although you haven't asked for it, <laughs> you are entitled to it and therefore we will give it to you all you have to do is sign here kind of it took me back so many years I'm beginning my 73rd year and so I'm going to indulge in a little bit of nostalgia here young people please don't go away it's not all going to be about nostalgia but I'm just going to tell you uh, how England was and why I I love it and uh, why it is home, really. Um, it was, it, it's been a long journey. Um, those of you who follow me know that uh, my, my beginnings were uh, the country of my birth uh, was Spain and I was raised in a, basically in the in the poor house, in the orphanage. And it's been a long journey. Um, and England gave me, Spain gave me my formative years as a child, but uh, England gave me everything else that I have done or have become. Nothing specifically <laughs> great, but I have been able to, to be relatively happy and to manage in life and you know, do certain things, and I'm okay, and and I owe this to England. Uh, apart from, and everything else gave me free university education. Imagine that. I'm eternally grateful, really. But let me let me go back. You see, um, how how did it come that I ended up? here or even my mother ended up here um spain having uh, gone through a horrific uh, civil war 1936 to 39 managed to stay neutral during the second world war but because of that and perhaps many other reasons <laughs> um, did not partake of the uh, help that America gave to all the European countries uh, the Marshall Plan, and so it took Spain a very, very long time. The, the country, the country was destroyed, and it took a very long time for Spain to get her feet off the ground. It was just beginning to in the early sixties, but uh, since the end of the Civil War, uh, the country had been destroyed, and it was very poor and. Uh, in some in some places, people didn't have jobs. And anyway, so they started emigrating to other European countries, namely uh, Germany, France, Switzerland, and England. Those were the four countries that they all went. People from my region of Spain, and they would come with a contract. These people are humble people of humble er origins and practically literate, really. Um, well, they, they did know how to read and write, and many even didn't. Um, but uh, they 
they were of humble, very humble, poor um, origins. And they would come with a contract for five years, most of them to clean hospitals for the most part. And you may ask, how, how did they manage uh, being practically illiterate in some old odd village in Spain managed to get a contract from the English government. Well, you see, they helped one another. You know, one emigrated somehow. I don't know zero emig immigrant who, who, who that was. But then if they knew that their neighbor or the other neighbor or whoever also was interested in coming, they would go to the office of the hospital and uh, tell them that um, um, you know, so and so was, uh, you know, a friend, a neighbor of theirs was interested in coming. Would uh, did they have any openings? Would they give them a contract? And so they would send the written contract by mail, and then they would sign it. And everything was done beforehand, before they landed. But they all came helping one another. Really, that is what they were doing. But they they all came with this contract. And uh, so my mother was one of them who, through a neighbor and the neighbor and the cousin of the neighbor, or whoever it was, ended up with a contract, signed it, and was able to come. Um, and then she later proceeded to bring, as immigrants do always, uh, her children. And she brought my older brothers first and then me and then my two younger sisters. My two younger sisters were still children really so they stayed here, they never went back and they're practically English 100%. Well, perhaps not 100% but they, they, they have no connection really with the country where they were born. My two brothers, being older, uh, returned uh, eventually uh, to Spain. And, uh, and I was kind of in the middle because I was not quite 18. And so uh, I was still sort of Spanish, but then throughout my life, I, so I find myself being to put it in some sort of a romantic way, just just to give it some sense, that I I am in the middle, I sort of retain, as it were, a Spanish heart, but I have more of an English mind. What I mean by that is that I am both, but I am neither 100%. Um, I went back to Spain just to see what it was like uh, not many years ago, a couple of years. And uh, I did fully expect it to be completely different, of course, from the country I, I remembered so, so many years ago. And it was different. But what I hadn't anticipated was the fact that I would feel like a foreigner in my own country of birth. Um, and I did feel so. Um, it was a completely different country, different people with different values. Um, I didn't feel at home. And I remember when my sister came to visit me one day from England and she brought her English money and uh, I remember the plugs, the three prong plug that we have in England, which is different from most countries, just the two, <laughs> two prong plug. But I mean, it was one plug that I looked at it and I said, oh goodness, um, I miss it. I'm homesick. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going back. And I did, I did come back. So um, I didn't feel at home there. I feel very much at home in England, having been here now for 60, 60 odd years. But nevertheless, one, one is continuously reminded that one is somehow an outsider. It's because of the foreign accent. Um, 
which one can't avoid. And uh, I know, th uh, you know, uh, you, you, you start a conversation with someone and out of curiosity, they don't mean to hurt you or anything or tell you anything negative, but out of curiosity is an instinctive reaction. People will say, oh, where are you from? You know. I'm going to ask you, when you're speaking in your own country with someone with a foreign accent, don't ask them where they're from, please, because you see what happens is you're going to find out in the course of the conversation. It's going to come out sooner or later. But that initial question, you see, you're not the only one. We have already been asked like five times, ten times that particular day and more the next day and the next and the next. So don't, <laughs> don't ask. I told my daughters that very early on. I said, just leave it alone because it will it will come up in the conversation. But in any case, you see, I'm. I am, um, uh, even though to me, me myself, feel very, very much at home. Nevertheless, I am not 100%. I am an outsider. So I am an outsider in both countries. And I, I went to the United States. I lived there for about um, 20 years, uh, 18 years. And I never, it never really bothered me, but I, I was, I also felt uh, an outsider. And indeed, I was. Uh, I felt homesick for England there too, very much so, and I wanted to to come back. Um, it's, it's, it wasn't that uh, the United States, it was nothing wrong with the, with the country itself, it's just that I didn't, I didn't take advantage of all the opportunities that the country offered. Uh, that is the conclusion I, I have formed. Um, I was uh, I went there from societies that had a class structure. In other words, I knew where I fitted. I don't want to over labor this point, but so in America where everything was open, it was up to you to seize the opportunity, to run with it, to seize the moment, to take advantage. And I, I didn't, I wasn't quick enough. I didn't adapt quick enough to that. Um, I didn't quite understand it, I suppose. So I didn't adjust as well as I had done in England, probably because I was older too. But anyway, I sort of came back home. Um, and going back to the to the very early memories, I I remember I had been here for about a month or so, and uh, both my mother and myself were um, had been out shopping or something, and we saw the bus that we needed to take, and we ran for it. It was just about to pull out, and we ran for it, and we made it. We got on, and I think I had been here for a month or so. I didn't speak any English, and so I I said to my mother, "Oh, thank God, we made it." I mean, I thought we wouldn't, but the, and my mother, I remember, said, "Shh." In public places, please do not speak Spanish. And I said, why not? And she explained it to me. A humble person, semi-literate, was able to explain it to me this way. It is their country. We are guests here. It must be very difficult for them in their own country to be hearing people yapping about in you know, in a language that they don't understand. I would find it difficult. I would find it annoying. So let us respect that. We are guests. And it is us who have to accommodate and conform ourselves 
to their values and their points. It's their country. She kept saying that. It stayed with me for a, for a very long time, that respect she had. I guess like a typical peasant, she knew her place. But she meant well. Uh, she, she was, and she loved England too. She said to me when, I think about two days before she died, um, I was, she loved talking about England and the things that had happened to her when she first came and she didn't speak English at all and all the <laughs> things. And, and I said to her, you love England, don't you, Mom? And she said, England was a mother to us all. And don't you ever forget. It, it, it's a, uh, yeah. So, anyway. Uh, so my respect and my love for England has remained she gave me, as I said, everything I have. My moral formation, as it were, the roots, the, uh, the seeds I got from the nuns, but she gave me everything else. Um, free university education. She gave me that, England. I hadn't contributed that much. I had worked and, of course, paid my taxes, minimal as they were in those wages. But that's what uh, England did for me. I owe her just about everything. When I, when I first came, I think I told you this before, the older ladies still wore hats when they went out. But it was uh, in the late eight, uh, 60s, and so things uh, had been changing for a while. And things were going to continue to change dramatically. I want to talk about the role of the, the major changes and how I think that uh, they have evolved or why they have evolved the way they were. I don't know whether I can call it progress. In many ways, yes. In others, not. I don't think the country is as I don't want to say proud. Um, the country is the country, okay, so the country is not as proud of itself as it once was, is not as certain of itself as it once was. What happened here? From an immigrant's perspective, you see that th um, immigrants no longer have this sense of uh, respect or gratitude. I think the first generation may still do, although not to that extent. Not among the young, I don't think. But certainly the second and third generation do not feel that gratitude. Why should they? They were born here, so they're citizens of this country. Um, so why do they feel any special uh, sense of gratitude? Um, the problem is that um, many of them, second and third generations, now demand the opposite of what my mother uh, stance was. And that is that they respect their culture, their language, their way of doing things. 
and it is accepted to a larger, uh, greater or lesser degree by most everybody that these minorities from people who were born in other countries or are the descendants of the people who came from other countries, that their way of doing things be respected. It seems as if their way of doing things has to take priority over the national culture. That's totally the opposite of how my mother felt, which was nothing but gratitude. And so, and so things have changed. Another, the English don't stand up as they were for their own culture. It was, when we first came in those days, it, it was difficult. We, we knew that we were not particularly liked as it were. But um, the English were polite. Not, not like the French. I have a friend from Romania who emigrated to France and then to England. And he told me that he was once at the post office and uh, did I tell you this already? I told someone. And and uh, at the post office, the clerk asked him, and where are you from? And he said, from Romania. And the lady said, and when are you leaving? <laughs> we never got that from the English, at least not directly as such. Uh, but so that is one of the things that have changed dramatically that um, the immigrants demand respect for their own culture rather than accept and admit and recognize uh, that there was a culture here beforehand and perhaps it is them who had to who have to adapt to to the country that accepted them. That to me is, I don't know whether you agree to it, perhaps many of you don't, but it makes sense to me. The other thing that has changed is also the leaders of society, the values that they have or they had. Those aristocratic values in England from the people at the top, the powerful, which were, yes, I admit, rather paternalistic. They accepted this hierarchical um, structure in society. But they, they had a certain paternalistic attitude. I don't know whether, I think the Israeli, uh, the 19th century prime minister was perhaps one of the ones who expressed it. In other words, they accepted their stand at the top, but nevertheless, they had the, to a large extent, the well-being of the country as a whole in mind. From where I'm looking, you can see that there is nothing more distance than, you know, an English aristocrat. And a little girl from an orphanage in Spain. It, absolutely nothing in common. We couldn't be further apart. But actually, I do find that I have something in common with them in the sense of duty and responsibility and so on and so forth, which were the values that they had at any rate, for their country. And then that little by little changed, didn't it? And so the, um, not the old money, but the new money came along, and businesses and, and with that all they are revised. And it is quite funny for me, looking at it from 
the very bottom, as it were, and seeing both of them. And so this new class of people, the, uh, the business people, the money people, the new money, brought with them different values. And obviously money was the first and profit and so on. And then, even then, being now the new aristocrats would in time uh, change and instead of being thinking of money and profit and thinking in a national framework, they began to think, haven't they, about not a national but an international or a supranational uh, way. And so we now we have uh, uh, an elite, uh, 1% uh, of, um, you know, the, the financiers, the people at the top who are not at the top just in their own countries but worldwide. And so their concerns, it seems to me, is for this click there to continue having that power without any terms of reference or any regard necessarily for the nation they come from. And so, of course, um, we that is that is how it. how it developed and uh, where we are today. And you may agree or disagree that this is a good thing. And uh, this is, if you look at it from a political point of view, you may agree or disagree, depending on where you are. But that makes sense to me um, to understand what is happen happening politically. I can only understand within that reference of the nation state and those at the top of what used to be the nation state, those with their allegiance to something else outside of the nation state. And so societies are, um, well, societies, but certainly the leaders of each nation being demanded to obey um, or follow directions made upstairs on the Politburo of <laughs> global power have to follow those instructions and the nation state is very much a second thought. Um, anyway, I, I want to just leave it there. Um, I am beginning my 73rd year and I just wanted to pay tribute to England, this wonderful country that uh, It hurts sometimes a little bit to see what is going on. It doesn't deserve. To, it doesn't deserve being uh, attacked or dismantled in this way by foreigners and by natives alike. It doesn't deserve it. I think we um, I think we have to stand up and defend England. I don't <laughs> don't know how to do that. Um, well, I do it in my own little way here anyway on a YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you, England, for all you have done.
for my family and myself. You may think you haven't done anything, but you have. And if I ever, God forbid, <laughs> these two countries of mine were in a war or something, what would I do? I would be on England's side. I hope that doesn't make me a traitor. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Long live, long live England, the UK. Bye-bye.